with all the online content you could be watching. We're glad you're joining us as we find and follow Jesus together. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. Through him all things were made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. The Word was God. Howdy Faith Church. Happy 2024. Great to see you. I want to thank you again for your generosity to Faith Church. You have been generous in your prayers. You've been generous in serving one another. You've been generous in caring and loving. You've been generous financially in all the different ways that you give to ensure that we can help people find and follow Jesus. But in December, we asked you to do extraordinary giving. Just want to let you know that $85,000 you gave so that we can help people that are struggling with food insecurity, so we can help people in the foster and adoption system, so we can help people know about Jesus and salvation. Southeast Asia. Thank you for being generous. It matters. We are continuing in a series in the book of John called The Word Was God. And it's looking at Jesus through the eyes of John, Jesus' best friend on earth. And so we learn from all of scriptures, but from what John is teaching us, that when you seek Jesus, you will find Jesus, and he will help you, not only in 2024, but forever. So if you have your Bibles, we're in John chapter 1, verse 35 through 42, John chapter 1. And, you know, around here, the Bible is really important. And so if you don't have a copy of the Bible, you should download a copy. We use the NIV translation, New International Version. We'd love to send you a paper copy if you're online or stop by guest services. We would love to arm you with this incredible thing called the Bible because the Bible is a compass and a guide that leads us and guides us in each and every day. And so love for you to bring your Bible, follow along. You can download our app as well, where you can take notes for your small group or whatever. But just being armed with a Bible, engaging with the Bible is going to help you in your everyday life. It's helped me in immeasurable ways. And so I'll I'll talk a little bit more about that a little later, but just encourage you to follow along in the scriptures with us. It's really a helpful tool. Before we get to John chapter one, can I give you a little New Year's pep talk, Joe style? You mind if I just take a moment, this is sort of extra, has nothing to do with the sermon, but just a little pep talk for 2024. And maybe just to ask you this question, when you look at 2024, what's your safe, I don't know how to spell, safety net. What's your safety net in 2024? Like what, what's underneath everything you do and say? So here's what I know, it's 2023, and it's not profound, but in 2023, We had some really great days, right? And so last year you like had some days you rejoiced and had so much fun and you laughed. Then we all had some fine days. You know what a fine day is? Like, that was fine. That was a fine day. That was a fine week. That was a fine month. It was fine. And we had some really dark and difficult days. We all did. Where we're depressed or discouraged, where we wonder even how we're gonna make it through the day or the week or the month, are we going to make it through the year? We're distressed, we're discouraged. But guess what? Guys, you made it. We made it. It's 2024. And guess what? Just because the calendar changes doesn't mean anything's going to change. So that means in 2024, you're going to have some joyful days where you're going to rejoice and be so excited. You're going to have some fine days, some days that are just fine. And you're going to have some days that are dark and difficult, and you're going to wonder how you're going to make it. It's going to happen, right? And so what's your safety net underneath that? Like what, what holds you up when all of that's happening? So Jesus in John chapter 16, he says, in this world, you will have trouble. So we can translate this and go, in 2024, guess what? It's not if, you will have trouble. What then? What do you put your trust in, right? Do you put it in your bank account? Do you put your trust in your good looks? 
Do you put your trust in your job? Do you put your trust in your health? Do you put your trust in your relationships, your 401k? What do you put your trust in? Because Jesus doesn't say, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, you're gonna overcome. No, you're not. He has. He has overcome. And so like a pep talk is not telling you that whatever happens in 2024, you're going to overcome. A pep talk is saying, Jesus will, if he's your safety net. But if everything you've got is putting you and your ability and your strength and your bank account and your health and your relationships, you're in trouble. Honestly, you're in trouble. And so it's like, okay, what do we do? In this world, you will have trouble, but Jesus has overcome. Uh, Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians. He says, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. If your hope today is in religion or tradition, or you always go to church, or you've always gone to church, if your hope is in religion or in tradition, you know what Paul's saying, Jersey style to you? You're pitiful. If this is just about coming to church instead of brunch, give me your seat. You're holding space. Get out of here. Go do something different. But if Jesus really lived and died and rose again, and you believe he's coming again, and he has eternal pleasures at your right hand, his right hand, forevermore, then that changes everything, right? And so when difficulty comes this year, I hate to say this, I'm such a realist, not all of us are gonna make it through 2024. Not everyone listening to me is going to make it. People are suffering. People are going to die. People that we love are going to die. What then? If this is just religion, then this is a pitiful gathering, the most pitiful gathering of all the Lehigh Valley. But if Jesus is who he says he is, and he reigns forever, then whatever comes in 2024, He's overcome it and I can trust him and I have eternal pleasures at his right hand forevermore. And that sort of sets the pace for everything I do. Hebrews chapter 13 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's my hope. That's my pep talk. Jesus has overcome so that whatever you and I have to face in 2024 and beyond, if he's your safety net, if he's what you count on, if he's what you hope for, whatever happens, the best or the worst year you've ever had, the hardest or the most joyful circumstances of your life, if he is who he says he is, then we have hope. We have a reason to live and we have a reason to walk. And that's why here at Faith Church, we can't stop talking about Jesus. It's why we pray and in his name. It's why we sing praises to him because he changes everything and gives us the help that we need for today and the strength for tomorrow and every day until we see him face to face. Happy New Year. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for coming and loving us and caring about us. You know each person listening and you know what our 2023 was like and you know what our 2024 you're ahead of us and you sweep up behind us and you meet us in our greatest trials and you meet us in our greatest joys and you understand what it's to weep at a grave and to struggle with injustice, but you also know what it was like to celebrate at a wedding and at a birth. You know everything in between and you want us to seek you and find you and to follow you and to obey you because you are the only thing that does not change. My bank account will change, my health will change, my relationships will change, but you won't. You're my safety net. You're our safety net. We either fall on you or we fall away from you. Help us this year to fall on you in every situation and circumstances. When we fall, may we fall on you because we know you'll catch us, you'll help us, you'll love us, you'll put us back on a solid ground and we are yours forever. We entrust Faith Church to you and all that we do and say, we entrust each person watching online, here in the chapel, here on campus, we entrust everything to you. You are our hope and our joy. We wanna know you and love you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Have your Bibles, John chapter one. 
John the Baptist, we were introduced to last week. Sam did a great job of reminding us that John the Baptist is this guy who's the opening act for Jesus, but he's not the main act. And so John the Baptist shows up and says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, John knows that Jesus isn't just a good moral teacher or a carpenter. He's the son of God. And it causes him to express how much Jesus has changed his life and point to everyone to Jesus. He's been transformed by Jesus. And so now he can't help talk about Jesus. So we read in John chapter one, verse 35, the next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, Jesus replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and they spent the day with him and it was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and to tell him, we found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. This is God's word. Let's unpack it together. So John is causing a little bit of a stir in his region. He's preaching and teaching about the kingdom of God and causing people to get excited that something's new, something's changing. He's speaking in such a way and saying certain things that are causing people to sort of sit up in their seats. And there's uh, eager people in his region that want to know God and want to follow God, but they don't know how. And so John's sort of the opening act, getting them ready, preparing them for the great act that's going to come in Jesus. So they're swarming around John. There's lots and lots of people. And John says, when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. This is now the second time in two days he's made this statement He sees Jesus passing by. He's the guy in the center. Everyone's around him and he watches Jesus stroll by and he goes, look, 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 look. Don't look at me. Look, the Lamb of God. He's done this now twice. Now, why would he call Jesus the Lamb of God? His audience would hear Lamb of God and they would immediately know the history of the Jewish people, that the Jewish people for 400 years were enslaved and they cried out to God for help and God rescued them. But God rescued them in a very unique way. And this celebration called Passover that the Jews would remember that he would say to them, if you want me to rescue you, kill a lamb and paint it on the doorposts. And if you do that act of faith, I will rescue you. And so John knew that when he would say these words, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, they would immediately have this picture in their mind that by the act of faith, that they believe like if God said to you, kill a lamb and put blood on the door, you'd be like, that sounds whack. But if you say it, God, I'll do it. And so when he would say to them, look, the Lamb of God who takes away this, they would in their minds be like, okay, rescue is coming, but it's going to be an act of faith. And now he's scanning the crowd day two. He looks at the crowd and goes, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Then again, he sees Jesus stroll by and he goes, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is so interesting. Look what happens next. When two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. There are crowds following John the Baptist, crowds of people. And now day one, he goes, look, the Lamb of God, nobody moves. Nobody does anything. John goes, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, nobody moves. Now day two, he goes, look, the Lamb of God. And Jesus is just kind of strolling by. Two of the disciples hear this and they go, hey, maybe we should pay attention to what this guy is saying Maybe we should do something. So they followed Jesus. Based on what John said, not because Jesus was doing, Jesus has been walking around their area for 30 years and nobody's followed him yet. And now all of a sudden he goes, look, the Lamb of God. Look, the Lamb of God. And two guys are like, well, maybe we should follow him. Now I'm from North Jersey. If someone starts following you, you do what Jesus did. Turn around, Jesus is like, what are you doing? Like, what do you want? 
right? Like you've been walking around for 30 years. Nobody's following you. Now you look back and two guys are following you. You don't know. You go, what do you want, right? I mean, I just project a Jersey accent into that. Like, what do you want? Like, maybe that's not there. But immediately Jesus is, felt, feels better because they call him rabbi, which automatically goes teacher. These are two people that want to be taught. They want to be learned. They want to learn something. There's something about them choosing based on what John says to follow because they want to learn something. They want to explore something. They want to experience something. Rabbi, where are you staying? Back one, go back. Rabbi, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. Notice that Jesus doesn't answer their question. Hey, where are you staying, Jesus? Now again, Jersey style, I wouldn't tell him either, right? Like, what are you, crazy? He's like, come on. Come and you will see he does not answer their question. Hey, we want to follow you. Where are you going? He doesn't answer their question. He says, come and see. And it's about four o'clock and they spend the rest of the day together. What did they do? We don't know what they did. But two guys here twice, Lamb of God, they start to follow. Jesus says, come and see. They spend the afternoon together into the evening, and we see what happens next in verse 40. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard what John had said and who had followed. Based on what John said, he chose to follow. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we found the Messiah. We don't know what they did, but there's something in this experience where they're hanging out together. They're talking, they're whatever they're doing, playing Fortnite. I'm not sure. There's something about this where Andrew goes, we found the Messiah. He goes and tells his brother, we found the Messiah. Now for Jewish people to hear, we found the Messiah. Again, for hundreds of years, they've been wandering, hoping, longing that God would do something. When they would hear, we found the Messiah, the anointed one, the priests were anointed. David was anointed. Elijah was anointed. We found the anointed one. Andrew spends a little bit time with this guy. Jesus has been hanging around the area for 30 years, but all of a sudden he goes, no, we found the anointed one. And he goes and tells his brother, his brother, I have an older brother. If I told my brother I found the anointed one, he'd be like, like, what are you smoking? Right? Like, what are you talking about? Right? And yet there's something about this experience that causes Andrew's brother to follow. Look what happens. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas. And he brought him to Jesus. So this this scene is so incredible. John the Baptist is out in the wilderness. He's causing a stir. He's talking about the kingdom of God. People, crowds are following around him. They're getting baptized. This is some momentous moment. And two different days, he sees some dude walk in that everybody would recognize, walking by and says, there's the Lamb of God, there's the Lamb of God. Of all the crowds of people, two decide to peel off and follow Jesus. Say, where are you going, Jesus? He says, come and see. They spend some time together, a little bit of Xbox, food, laughter, whatever they did. Andrew is convinced that Jesus is now the Messiah in this short amount of time, and he grabs his brother, and he says, hey, you got to see this guy. And he brings his brother in. There's no introductions. Jesus looks at his brother and goes, hey, isn't your name Simon, you're the son of John. I'm going to start calling you Cephas, which means Peter or rock. Hmm. And I step back from this scene, from the text, and I go, what's going on and what can I learn about Jesus and interacting with Jesus? And there's a couple things that are noteworthy to me, hopefully helpful to you. You know that Jesus strolls into all our lives? I mean, Jesus has been strolling around your life since you were born. Have you noticed it? Jesus, the Lamb of God, is also the Lion of Judah. He is strong, but he is gentle. And in this season in time, he strolls. What does stroll mean? Stroll means take a leisurely walk. In modern America, when you see someone strolling, it doesn't fit into our culture, strolling. We're like... Let's go, come on, get moving. What are you doing? We don't leisurely walk anywhere. Don't you have places to go and people to see? We got work to do. Ain't no time for strolling around here. The Alpha and the Omega is strolling around our world. Have you seen what's going on in the Middle East, Jesus? 
Have you seen the poverty in Africa and in Asia? Have you seen the injustice and the abuse and the trafficking of humans? Have you seen the trauma that my neighbor and my people feel? Do you see the cancer? Do you see the heartbreak? And you're strolling? Yeah, the Lamb of God is the Lion of Judah, and he's gentle and strong and strolling. He's not making big fanfare. He's not bringing attention to himself. He's not saying, you will follow me. You will bow down to me. You will honor me. He's walking around and has been walking around your life since you were born. And he is strong as a lion and as gentle as a lamb and lays down his life for people. But very few crowds notice. Two in this scene from the crowds peel off and go, I'll go follow The rest of them were hanging out with John the Baptist. You know, it takes a decision to say I'm hungry enough and I'm needy enough that I want to seek after this Lamb of God who is the Lion of Judah. And you begin to follow, you start to see things. But it takes your initiative. He's not gonna make you. He's not like got a remote control up in heaven going, you will follow me. He's not screaming or shouting. He's quiet and still and gentle and strolls. The moment you decide, I'm gonna seek, I'm gonna walk, I'm gonna explore, I'm gonna check out. With, with Simon, I'm convinced that his motives were messed up. His brother's like, I found the anointed one. And his brother's like, yeah, I think you're crazy. You've been smoking something, but I wanna check out what you've been smoking. So he walks to find out. His motives are mixed in why. And yet, Simon Peter goes and sees And at some point, if you're willing to explore, you're willing to seek, if there's some level of curiosity and humility and hunger, you get to the point where you ask the question, Jesus, where are you going? And it might come out for you like this, um, Jesus, what the heck are you doing? Where are you going? What are you doing? Why are you doing that? Why aren't you doing this? It might come out of bitterness and anger where you go, Jesus, what are you doing? Where are you going? It might come out of curiosity. Jesus, I don't understand what's happening. It might come out of pain. God, I'm so lost. Where are you and what are you doing? And why aren't you helping me? It comes out as a question to the God of the universe from the curious or the painful going, where are you and what are you doing? And his answer is almost always the same. As I've walked with Jesus for 30 years, His answer to me is almost always the same, come and see. It's never details. It's never science. It's never answers that I want when I want them. His invitation is, come and follow me, and I will show you, Joe. And that's really, really hard, because in modern America, we want answers. We want proof. We want logic. We want details. Tell me how it's all going to go, and then I will follow you. Show me what it's going to be like, and then I will trust you. But this whole idea of walking with Jesus is a walk of faith. And in modern America, we don't like faith. Because look at what the Bible defines faith. Faith is being confident in what you hope for and have assurance about what you don't see. This is not an American ideal. We want evidence. We want proof. We want details. Tell me how my cancer diagnosis is going to go, and then I will trust you. Tell me how the relationship is going to end or where it's going to start, then I will trust you. Tell me how I'm going to make it through this job or this situation, then I will follow you. That is not faith. Faith is being confident of what you hope for and assured of what you do not See, and can I tell you, you know this already, that's really hard, isn't it? It's really hard. But Jesus says, come and see. Come and see. And every time he says, come and see, it's an invitation to be with him. He wants to be with you and with me. And he knows if we asked a question like, where are you going? And he told us, we'd go off on our own path. We do our own thing. We go, well, Jesus said that that's the way it's gonna be, and so then I would go do this. Instead of, no, he wants me side by side, connected with him. He wants to walk with me and me to walk with him. It's a walk 
of faith, not of evidence. Not of, it doesn't mean that there's not good evidence and good science and good logic in Christianity. It doesn't mean you have to check your brain at the door to follow Jesus. But there comes an end to your science, an end to your logic, an end to your ability to know. And at that end, when you get to the end of science, the end of medicine, the end of what you know rationally, what do you close that gap with? You close it with, I believe, I trust you, I wanna be with you, will you be with me? And he says, walk with me, I want to be with you. That's not religion, it's not a transaction, it's a relationship where Andrew was with Jesus and by being with Jesus for that handful of hours, it gave him confidence to say, I know the Messiah, the anointed one, I know him. It was through being with him. So what does it mean? What does it look like for us to be with Jesus? It's sort of weird to think about and best thing I can do is just kind of give you examples from my life. What does it mean for me to be with Jesus? For me to be with Jesus, I'm with my Bible. I'm with my Bible. The Bible isn't Huckleberry Finn or a great novel. It, the Bible is the work of God that's been preserved over thousands of years that details who God is, that he's entrusted to us to know his very heart. It's written over 1,600 years by 40 different authors with no contradiction in substance. It's this incredible work that as you begin to engage with it, it begins to give you a compass and a guide and direction to how to live and to walk. And so for me, being with Jesus is spending three, four, five, six times a week with my Bible open, reading, asking God to show me that the spirit of God that lives inside us as sons and daughters wrote the word of God and the two things sync up inside me as I engage. So people will say to me, and I've been there too, well, I don't hear from God. Well, when was the last time you opened your Bible? I don't use a Bible. Well, you're not gonna hear from God. He wants to engage with you, open up what he's entrusted to you, his word, and ask him to show you and guide you. It's talking to God, and I know we hear that as prayer, but I don't know. I, I literally have ADHD, I, like I had to tell you that. Um, and I literally have ADHD, and so, so I know for me, my talking to God is like text messages, and my text messages are really short. It looks like, God, I need help. God, I'm scared. God, I'm worried about my kids. God, my relationship with my wife is struggling right now. God, we just got into a fight. Should I say sorry? God, was she wrong or was I wrong? God, I'm not sure what to do with my finances. God, I don't know how to be generous in this situation. God, thank you for putting me in America. God, thank you for all the blessings. Help me not to be bitter. Help me not to look at all the things that are wrong with our country. Help me see all the things that are right. God, give me a grateful heart. God, thank you. I praise you that you rescued this numbskull from the pit of hell. My prayers are text messages to God. And I'm stupid enough to believe that he actually text messages me back. And it comes in the form of really little simple things on the daily where he's like, son, go that way. Son, stop that. Son, you're being a baby. Quit complaining. Son, be grateful. Son, here's what I want you to do. Go that way. Walk this way. Real short, real simple. As my Bible is open and I'm engaging with God and I'm listening to him and I'm talking to him and he's talking to me and he's really, I've never heard God in an audible voice, right? I'm just saying that's not been my experience, but he has nudged me and guided me and led me and being with God is often for me being with worship music. The worship music that we would play in the chapel or play here in the center, it just communicates something to me and I hear truth in a way that touches my heart. And so there's times of just listening to worship music and that's being with God. Being with God for me is being with my small group of guys that meets on the regular because God is in that person and God is in that person and God is in that person and God is in that person. And we're all wrestling with what the Bible says and we're all not sure how to deal with relationships and we're all struggling and we're all rejoicing and we're doing it together. And so being with that group is like being with God. I'm with him in his in Bible. I'm with him when I talk to him. I'm with him when I'm surrounded by brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm with him and being with him is what changes me and helps me. It's not a transaction. It's come and see Joe and I want to be with you. Do you want to be with me? And when you're with Jesus, he sees and encourages the real you. 
I love the scene at the end with Peter, Simon. I love that, just that little, it's like Andrew's like super excited to, to take his brother and, and Jesus isn't introduced to Peter. He just sees Peter and he goes, hey, aren't you Simon? Your dad's John, right? I'm gonna call you Cephas, which means Peter, which means rock. Imagine how encouraging that was. God knew something about Peter that he needed to be told in that moment, you're the rock. How encouraging would that be if God would see you and call you by name? And that's what he does to all of us. He sees the real you, the best version of you, and wants that. There's this myth in Christianity that it's all about brainwashing everyone to act and look the same way. That's malarkey. That's malarkey. Absolutely, as followers of Christ, we are with one voice, the people that should be saying no to sin and injustice and evil. That we should be aligned on. We should absolutely be a group of people that love like Christ loves and act like Christ. That way we should all be alike. But man, you love flowers? God loves that you love flowers and wants you to be the best flower lover there ever was. You're good with numbers or good with your hands? He knows that about you. He made you that way. He doesn't want that to be removed. He wants that to become the best version. You love elderly people or you love children? I don't like either of those types of people, but that's what makes you great, right? I'm just, okay, I'm just kidding, right? I love all of you. But there's something about when we follow Jesus and we spend time with Jesus, he wants to make you into the best version of you, not like your brother or your sister or the guy or girl in your small group, you. So when you spend time with Jesus, what he's rubbing off of you is not your personality. He's rubbing off your sin, the parts of you that need to go so that you could become the best version of yourself. And so when we get to heaven, guess what? You're gonna bump into Jersey Joe. He's just gonna be the best version of Jersey Joe. I'm not gonna suddenly be Pennsylvania Joe. It's not possible, right? I'm going to be the best version, the one without an attitude, the one that's not cynical, the one that's not crude, but I'm gonna be Joe, the best version, because that's what happens when you spend time with Jesus. You become the best version of you, and when you're convinced Jesus is the Messiah, you tell people. You don't go to discover faith and you don't get in a small group and you don't go to discover Jesus to learn how to tell people about who's changed you. If Jesus has changed you, if he's forgiven you of your sins, if, you, if he makes you the best version of you, how can you not tell people about him? Not in a preachy way, not in a neat, tidy way. You just talk about what you love, right? And so if you love Jesus, you talk about him to other people people. It's just what you do. So I love that Andrew spent like no time with Jesus. He didn't go to a class. He didn't get baptized yet. He just was like, Peter, you got to see this guy. I know who is the Messiah. Come and see. And then Jesus did the work of transforming Peter. That wasn't Andrew's job. It's just, hey, come and see. Just like Jesus said, come and see me. When we know Jesus, we invite other people to just come and see Jesus. Here's where I want to end. C.S. Lewis, great thinker of last century, great apologist. He wrote a book called The Weight of Glory, and it reminds me of 2024, of how to approach 2024. If we let ourselves, he's talking to Christ followers, if we let ourselves, we shall always be waiting for some distraction or other to end before we can really get down to our work. If we let ourselves, we could look at 2024 and go, I'm going to wait for something to be over or something to start, for some relationship to end or some diagnosis to be better or some treatment or some situation. I'm going to wait. If we let ourselves, we'll always be waiting for some distraction or other to end before we can really get down to our work. The only people who achieve much are those who want knowledge so badly that they seek it while the conditions are still unfavorable. Faith Church, favorable conditions never come. So if 2024 for you is about waiting for some right condition for you to start acting or thinking or feeling or believing, 
I hate to tell you this, favorable conditions won't come. So wherever you are in your spiritual journey, and maybe somebody dragged you here and you're like, I'm not sure why I'm even here, but I'm sort of curious. Favorable conditions will never come, but Jesus strolls into your life today. If you've been following Jesus for a really long time, I know that following Jesus for a long time, some of us are just bored. It's like I've been to Discover class, I've been in a small group, I've served, I've given, I'm bored. Is there anything more? Favorable conditions won't come. God, I remember what it was like to be on fire for you. So I'm gonna wait for that to happen again. Favorable conditions won't come. I'm gonna wait for a better health, a better relationship. Favorable conditions will never come. You will make excuses the rest of your life or whoever is hungry, the ones who want something so bad that they go, Jesus, you're strolling by, I wanna know you. Jesus, you wanna spend time with me? I wanna spend time with you. Jesus, I'm gonna open my Bible. I'm gonna talk to you. I'm gonna listen to you. I want you to change me into the best version of me because I can't change me. I'm going to be overcome, but you won't be. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Favorable conditions aren't gonna come, but you have come as a man and walked into my life. You will change me if I let you, so I'm gonna walk with you. I'm gonna follow you. I'm gonna trust you. I'm gonna obey you. Let's pray. God, thank you for being gentle. You're described as a lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And when you walked on planet earth, you were gentle and kind and you laid down your life. But you're also strong, really strong. You're the keeper, preserver of the universe called all things into being and you hold all things together. You are strong and you are gentle. So would you help us this year to embrace your strength and embrace your gentleness that we might also be strong and gentle, that we might spend time with you. You're close to us. You want to interact with us. You love us. You want to make us into the best version of ourselves. Would you remake us and remove our sin and shame? Help us to be like you. Be strong. Be gentle. Strong enough to clean us up and change us and transform us. Strong enough to use us in this world that we might not use strong language. Or we might not be preachy or mean-spirited or violent in any way but instead be strong in our love, strong in our patience, strong in our self-control, strong in our hope, strong in our faith, strong in our trust of you. We might look like you and act like you, and represent you well. You are our safety net. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. We trust you. We need you. We want to follow you. We'll obey you. In Christ's name. Amen.